everybody. We're so glad to see all of you here, and uh, we're praying today that you'll just be encouraged. Uh, we, we're going to look at God's Word. We're going to lean on God's Word. We're going to celebrate and rejoice in all that He has done. And I know some of you have had really hard weeks, and, and you're here, and you feel deflated, you're defeated, life is just beating you down, but we can trust in God. We can trust that He has our best interest at heart. God loves us very much. He proved it on the cross by sacrificing his son, Jesus. And so today, uh, let's just open our hearts to him. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. So we don't have to have it all together. Let's just come to him and allow the Father uh, to heal us where we're broken. And so I think it's important to look at scripture and as we sing to consider truth. And so let's stand together. Let's read this passage of scripture and then we're going to sing. So read with me, will you? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so let's rejoice in the Lord this morning. He is fighting our battle. To him be all glory forever.
is faithful. There's nothing that he cannot do on our behalf. Let's just simply trust him. Let's give him our hearts, church. As individuals, as a collective family of faith, let's trust in his sovereignty. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. Good morning, church, as we just 
spent a few moments worshiping. I don't know about you, but uh, man, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear this morning uh, that there's nothing that our God cannot do. Amen. I don't know what your week looked like this past week. I don't know what your week's going to look like next week. But one thing I do know is that God loves you. He is with you and he's ready to walk beside you wherever he takes you this week. And so this morning, uh, as we spend a little bit of time in prayer, I'm joined by some friends here behind me uh, who we are presenting for church membership today. We got the joy of celebrating and presenting some folks last week as well. You know, and as I was just thinking this morning, just giving God thanks, I realized that he is in his own perfect timing has given us this sermon series to talk about family. And we're welcoming people this morning into the church family here at Richland Creek. And and I just am so thankful that God has given us the local church. It's a special gift. As you think about from the book of Acts all the way to today, God designed his people to be in relationship with other people, to first be known by him and then be known by others. And so this morning, if this is your first time being a part of a gathering like this with God's people, let me tell you that you are here a part of something special. You're here a part of something unique that God has done and what a gift it is for us to be known by one another as we know and love the Lord. And so uh, I would just ask that as we talk about these folks here in just a minute, you just continue that thought of prayerful gratitude for who God is, for what he's done, and for how he's given you a body of people uh, called the church to be a part of. And so these folks standing here behind me are folks that have gone through our church membership process. They've met with a pastor. And it's our joy this morning to get to spend some time praying for them. And so this morning, as I pray, I would ask you to pray with me in two specific ways. Number one, I would ask that you pray for their continued growth in Christ's likeness, that the word of God would dwell, would dwell richly within them, and that as they grow in love for the Lord, as they build relationships here with other believers, that they would grow in discipleship, and then in turn, that we would celebrate the fact that God's given them a unique spiritual gift to use for the common good of this body here at Richland Creek. And then I would ask you to also pray for yourself. For those of you here that are covenant members of Richland Creek, I would ask that you pray that as a member, a fellow member of Richland Creek, that you would intentionally seek to come alongside them and help them in that process of looking more like Jesus, of loving him and loving his word, And that as they serve you, you would in turn serve them. And so this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer with those two things in mind. Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. You're so gracious and loving and kind. Lord, you have given us this body called Richland Creek for us to be a part of. God, as I look across the room this morning, I'm reminded of what heaven's gonna look like. Father, people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different stories, united alone by the shed blood of Jesus, the good news of the gospel. Father, that while we were yet in our sin, you sent Christ to die in our place, that we might be restored into a right relationship with you. And so, Father, we thank you so much for the gift of the local church. We thank you, Lord, that it is not a perfect place not made up of perfect people, but instead we serve and worship a God who is and who day by day continues to sanctify us to look more like his son. So Father, I pray for these families represented here behind me. Lord, I pray for each one of them that as they connect here at Richland Creek, God, that you would allow your word to dwell richly within them, that you would allow them to be able to build meaningful disciple-centered relationships. God, that they would be able Uh, to continue to grow in their wisdom and knowledge of your word. And Father, that as they serve those of us who are a part of this body using their spiritual gift, God, they would have great joy in doing so and you would receive much glory. And Father, now I pray for those of us who are covenant members here at Richland Creek. God, I pray that we would come alongside them. God, we would seek to live out Philippians 2, 4 through 7, that we would seek to put their needs above our own, that we would seek to uh, serve them, to love them and to challenge them uh, to look more like your son. 
Father, we do thank you for Jesus. And Lord, as we had just saying, God, we recognize this morning that there's nothing you cannot do. God, what seems impossible for us is not impossible for you. And so, Father, I pray this morning as we continue to sing and as we continue to study your word, that as you send us out, God, we would do so with great hope and great anticipation, taking the gospel wherever you would send us. Father, we love you. It's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. Would you join me and give them a warm welcome to Richland Creek by showing your applause. So church, uh, you can go ahead and stand up. There, there are many things we have to be thankful for this morning as we continue in worship. One of them is new people coming to the family. The other is the fact that we have a God who loves us, but most importantly, we're just thankful for the cross. We celebrated it a few weeks ago on Easter. Uh, we see it every Sunday here on the stage, and we remember uh, that it is the Lord Jesus who died in our place, who rose in a faithful resurrection, and, and who is one day coming back again. And so would you continue to join us this morning as we worship the Lord Jesus?
paid the penalty that we deserved. Lord, we pray that you would speak through Pastor Mike, that you would speak to us through your word today and that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Lord, we expect you to move in this place because we know that you're here. So Jesus, we thank you for that truth and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. Praise the Lord again one more time. It's so sweet to be with the family. We'll say welcome to Richland Creek. If you have your copy of God's Word, would you please open to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I want to say buenos dias familia, la gracia de Dios con ustedes as well. Uh, to those that are here today, so thankful uh, to be able to gather with the body of Christ as we walk through this series on family. And we are a family as a church of believers, but we also want to see godly families uh, that are here in our midst. So we're, this is our prayer that our families would be strong and godly. And so that's what we're doing is taking a couple of weeks looking at scriptures that look to the family. And Ephesians chapter 6 speaks to that. Last week we looked at the children. Uh, this week we're looking at parents, in particular fathers today is what I'll be speaking to. Next week on Mother's Day we'll be speaking to mothers as well. So uh, today I want to remind you about a couple things on your way in. Hopefully you picked up one of our worship guides. Uh, you can find information about stuff going, coming up here at Richland Creek. But inside of that today, you'll see an insert that has some resources available for you from books and different resources that might be helpful to you. We thought along the way, as we talked about being a godly family, we thought it would be helpful for you to have some good books and things to be reading as a family, and so there'll be something in there that's for everyone, something that will help you walk with the Lord, a resource. If you read through that, I would encourage you uh, to use that as well. Also, today, if you noticed, on your way in in the lobby, we do have our uh, VBS registration kind of starting, and we are so excited to have so many of you uh, that have already signed up and are already a part of it, but really, since we're talking about the family, we know, and I'll talk about this in a moment, the primary discipling uh, people in the, the life of children or the parents. That, that's what we know. And so uh, that, that's what's going to happen there. But we as a church want to come alongside of you as a family to help you disciple your children. And the way we do that is through something like Vacation Bible School, where, where we're going to talk about the gospel. We're going to talk about the scriptures. We're going to spend a week teaching the children the things of the word. And so we'd love to have uh, your children to sign up for that. Also, we need folks to serve. And so we'd love to have you to help us for that week as well. Out in the lobby, you turn to the left, you'll see over there the, the uh, surfboards and everything uh, to the side. Uh, be sure to go ask them any questions you have uh, or to be able to sign up. And also as you go over there, you notice they've got the Hawaiian shirts on today. They wanted me to wear, they didn't want me to wear, but I thought about if they, if they had me wear a Hawaiian shirt, I would become Rick Warren up here on the stage. So I know it's only a segment of people that will get that joke, but I thought it was pretty good uh, to look like Rick Warren up here. So anyway, if you've got your copy of God's Word open to Ephesians chapter 6, would you please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God? And if you looked in your worship guide today, you'll see we are just preaching out of one verse of the Bible today. So one verse, but in particular, this is the verse that speaks directly to fathers. So I wanted to spend some time on it today and also thought I'd talk a little bit so that you'd have a little time to stand before I make you sit right back down in a moment with one verse. So beginning Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, the Word of God says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of God the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we ask as we study your word 
that you would help us, in particular families in this room, to be godly. I pray for the fathers here today that we would rise to what you have called us to be in our homes as spiritual leaders. I pray for the parents, moms, and dad as well, that we would lead our homes well. And Lord, out of all of this, that you would raise us up as disciple makers, people who are investing the faith that you have delivered to us on down through the generations. For we pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. The great missionary, John G. Payton, you may, may have heard of him, he's was famous for taking the gospel to a, a fairly uh, dark place. He, he was known for taking the gospel to the New Hebrides Islands where there was known to be cannibals and to go and share the gospel where it would be fairly dangerous for him. If you're a reader, I would encourage you to pick up his autobiography. It's several hundred pages, but it reads like a Hollywood action film. I mean, every day he wakes up and it might be his last standing on the mission field. But John Payton was this pioneer missionary for a reason. If you were to read his autobiography, you, you learn that his faith was handed to him by his father. In many ways, he was greatly impacted by his dad. In his early years of his faith, he, even his burden for the lost came from times with his father. He wrote this in regarding to times hearing his dad pray. He said, how much my father's prayers at this time impressed me. He said, I can never explain, nor could any stranger understand. When on his knees and all of us as a family kneeling around him in family worship, he poured out his his whole soul with, with tears for the conversion of the lost world to the service of Jesus. And for every personal or domestic need, we all felt as if the presence of the living Savior, and, and we learned to know and love him as our divine friend. That's how John Payton describes hearing his dad pray. When he would hear his dad pray, you think he would go to reach the lost because he's heard his dad pray for the lost. He would even say of his dad, here, here's a direct quote, he said, he walked with God, why may not I do the same? I think about for us today with the impact of fathers. For John Payton, it was the defining point of his life. And with fathers having such an impact on the lives of their children, in particular parents both, I think it's right for us to spend a few moments looking at what it takes to have a godly home because godly homes are led by Christ-like parents. Godly homes are led by Christ-like parents. Parents. So what makes up a godly home? If we were to look to the Bible like we've been doing, and we were to say what, what exactly consists in a godly home, I'd like to give you a few things that are part of a godly home. First thing is that godly homes have leadership. Godly homes have leadership. We see it right here in the beginning of this verse, how God has designed the home exactly how he has made his creation, and he's designed it with a structure, with leadership. Look at verse four. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So here, the very first word is fathers. And the book of Ephesus would have been written to a church, right? It was Paul writing a letter to a church that was in the town of Ephesus, right? So this book of Ephesians is written to a church. And it would be read in an assembly just like this. You would get up on Sunday, the letter would have come in, they would have opened their Bible, stood in front of the group, and read this text. And in the midst of the assembly, where not everybody's a father, 
Paul addressed the fathers in the room. He said, fathers, that, that's who he was speaking to. Now this word, I want to press on it a little bit. Uh, the word is translated fathers here. It can also, in the book of Hebrews, it's translated as parents. So I, I think we have both fathers and parents in view with this verse. Because the Bible says, children obey your parents, and then fathers instruct their children. Does that mean mothers don't instruct their children? By no means, right? They, they both will do this task, but in a sense, the nod or the weight is given to the father. Both parents are to be honored and obey. obeyed. So let me press on this for a second. If, And I'll speak to something in our culture that I, you wouldn't think this would be challenging to say. But since we believe that the Bible defines our homes, we as Christians believe God made man male and female, two biological genders, male and female. And within the home, there is a husband and a wife. We believe marriage is between one woman and one man. And so therefore, if that is the case, God has designed the leaders of the home. And within that home, as Ephesians 5, just a few verses before this, it will say the husband is the head of the marriage, the household. He is the leader. And so even as you get to chapter 6, the, the dads, the, the husbands, the fathers, they're to lead in the instruction of their children. So, so, so let me say this out of the gate as I say it. Men, dads, you are the spiritual leaders of your home. You are the ones to lead out in godly, godliness and holiness in your home. Now, this not only is said from the Bible here in Ephesians 6, but it plays out practically in our homes. There was a study done several years ago of church attendance based of, of children based off of whether mom and dad were in church. The, the first first thing they looked at was if the dad, the dad doesn't go to church, but the mom does, the wife does. They said if that's the case, then when they grow up, only one out of 50 of those individuals will become regular worshipers if, if dad doesn't go to church. Then they looked at homes where dad regularly attends, and they didn't, didn't matter whether mom was going to church, it was if dad went to church. This is just a study, practically. They said if, if dad went to church, then when they grow up, when they, they become adults, then, it, then between two-thirds and three-quarters of the children would be regular attenders in worship. See, dads, you have leadership in your home. You matter to what you're doing in your walk with the Lord. Now, now let me press that to the side because I want to, I always want to be aware when I say something like that. I know that there are some moms in this room that are carrying the load. Maybe, maybe dad's at home. He doesn't, not a Christian. And you brought your kids here and you took, you put all that work in and you're here and you think, man, what did that preacher just tell me? That was the most discouraging thing I've heard. But, but here's what I want to press and say. Some of that you know, don't you? You know how hard it is as a mom to try to carry the weight of the spiritual leadership in your home. You're sitting here thinking, man, I wish that I had a dad here leading. But I want to encourage you today that I know those were statistics that somebody observed, but the gospel has the power to save anyone. And mom, I just want to encourage you, keep at it. Keep walking with the Lord, praying and trusting him, and he's going to use that effort to impact both uh, the husband, or maybe if you're a single mom here, to impact your children today. Because I guarantee you, across this room, there are individuals in this room that were raised by a mom that took them to church, and that's why they're here. And so you, I want to encourage you today as a, as a mom leading in the home. But let's shift back to dads, men in the room. Your faith matters. And it's more than just church attendance like I talked about a minute ago. You are the spiritual leader of your household. So what I'm asking you to do today is to lead your home well. It's, now, I want to say it's not easy. It's tough. But for us, being a father, being a dad, being a husband is more than just bringing a, a paycheck home and having a, a good golf swing. 
We're more than that in our house. We're put in a position of leadership in our home, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not some sort of dictatorship. You're, you're there to lead and serve your family. So dad's in the room. I, I want to press you on to, to not delegate the spiritual leadership in your home to your wife. I, I want to say don't push it off to the church. You're to be the one who is to lead your home. Now, this doesn't take moms out of the equation. The Bible says we're, we're both supposed to do this. Moms and dads are there to teach and instruct our children, but dads are the ones who lead this in our homes. Now, men, I, I want to talk to you for a minute because I think sometimes the response is, I would love to do that, I just don't know how. You, you may be sitting there in the seat and you think, preacher, I know you talk about this, but, but listen, you're a preacher. I mean, you, you study this, you went to seminary. This has got to be easy for you. That's not me. I, I'm not that kind of level of Christian. I, I don't know these, you know, I, I don't know what to do. But, but let me say this. I don't think, and, and hang with me because I, I, I'm going to be pretty strong here for a moment. I don't think your problem is, is whether you know what to do. I think your problem might be is that you don't care to know what to do. And, and I press on this to say, we learn to do the things we care to do. We figure it out. I'll give you an example. When I was in high school, uh, I didn't grow up playing golf. It was not a sport that I, I had learned. And so when I was in high school, uh, my friend, we turned six, I turned 16, I had a friend that played a lot of golf. And so I started playing golf got me an old set of clubs and started just going out and picking up the game of golf. And up until this past year, I had never had a lesson in golf in my life. And if you saw my swing, you might actually believe that's true. Uh, but I had never had a golf lesson. But you know what? I, I figured out how to play golf. I've shot in the 80s before as a, as a golfer, and I did that all without a single lesson. I would go, and if I was playing with a buddy and he was pretty good, I'd try to get him to show me a few things, you know, you pick up something. I'd practice, I'd go watch a few YouTube videos. I, I might read some things about the golf swing. And so I would figure out a way to be able to play golf. Why? Because I cared. You and I learn how to do things that we care about. You might sit here today, you know how to fix a car, you know how to swing a golf club, you might know how to fish, you might know how to, I don't know, play a video game, or you're really good at collecting coins. I'm trying to think all the list of things dads do, right? You might be really good at some things, but are you good at discipling and leading your home spiritually. I'll just say this, I believe that you can figure it out if you genuinely desire to do it. There's men all over this room. I, I'm looking around this room, I know there's some godly dads in this room. I can see them. I know their families, I know how they lead their homes. I promise you that there are men in this room that will take the time to teach you how to be a godly man. There are, they would love to see you lead your homes well. So, so for you today, the Lord is calling us, you and I, as, as leaders of our homes, to lead spiritually where the Lord has placed us. So that, that's, that's the first thing is, we're, the home is, has leadership. Godly homes have leadership. Here's the second thing I want you to see, is that godly homes have love. Love and affection. There's, there's, if you were to think of this, moment, the Lord has given mom and dad leadership and power, authority in the home, but then he puts a little bit of restraint on it, right? Because if my kids are supposed to obey me, I'm the leader of my home, then I'll, I'll just go home, sit in my recliner, start barking orders, right? Go get my slippers, right? That's at least what sounds like I should say. I don't even know if I have slippers. <laughs> but you've you think that, that that was what we would do, right? If I just have authority, I'll just start barking orders. My kids will just obey what I say, right? But the Bible puts a limit on this authority. Look at verse four. Here's the limit. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That, that's the limit. We have a limit to what 
sort of leadership and authority we have our, over our kids. Now, let me make this clear. This isn't you, you shouldn't ever make your kids angry. But it is, you should not be the reason that they're angry. In essence, if I'm standing by a road with traffic, I've got my child, and they say, I want to go play in traffic, right? And I say no, and they get angry, that's not what we're talking about here. But if me as a parent wrongly treat them in a way that's frustrating, irritating, and, and improper, then they get angry because of me. That's the problem, is you should not be the reason they get angry. Now, as I was reading this this week, I read several commentaries, and, and they came up with a list of ways you can provoke your children to anger. So let's go through the list for a moment. I've got, I boiled them down to four things. And I'll say this before I jump into the list. As I go through them, like I did, I, I think, oh yeah, I've seen that family. You'll think of names. You'll think of other parents, maybe even your own, and think this is what they did. That's, that's what our pride does. So let's think about ourselves for a moment. What, which one of these do we wander into? So here's the first one. First way we provoke our children to anger is achievement. A, a drive for achievement. This is Sometimes you're forgetting that they're kids and you start to press on them things that only adults can do. You start pushing your goals on your children instead of allowing them to be themselves. Sometimes you fail to express approval even at the small things. And typically those who are driving at achievement are quick to find fault and slow to encourage. That's kind of the drive for achievement. Now, to be clear here, what does the Bible say for you and mom, you as a mom and dad, is the benchmark of success? So if you raise your kids well, is it the fact that they are financially prosperous and that they have done well in life? Is that what the Bible calls us to do? Because I don't think it is. The Bible says that we should raise them up so that they will follow the path of the Lord, right? That's, that's what we're called to do. We're supposed to lead them to the gospel, and then from the gospel, their hearts are supposed to pursue God. That's our mark of success, not these things of the world. So achievement, here's the second one. Love as a reward or punishment. Love as a reward or punishment. This means you might withdraw love from them as a means of punishment. It sometimes shows up in favoritism that you're treating one child better than the other. And then finally, as a part of this love, I think the, the classic modern day helicopter parent, you know, the one that smothers and is always around their child. Third way you can do this is inconsistency. That God is consistent with his law, but you are inconsistent, whether it's with the rules you set, the discipline you place, or the life that you live. Inconsistency can be a means of provoking your children to anger. Finally, the fourth one is neglect. Whether that's physical or verbal abuse, or all the way down to some form of you just neglecting your child because you're too busy living your life and you don't care to spend time with them. Any one of these is a means of provoking your children to anger. It's a source for them to be irritated with you and not other things. So then what is you as a parent? How do you act? If the Bible says don't provoke them to anger, what's the way you, you do act? You, you lead your home with love. Look at, look at verse four again. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but, here's what you do instead, right? And, and just this phrase, bring them up. It, you might skip it quick because it just sounds like, just raise them, right? Just, just see them grow, and grow up. But, but there's a little bit more here. This term, bring them up, is a, a term of nurture and care for someone. It's the same word in chapter 5, verse 29, where the husband is to nurture and care and love his wife. That, that that's what a parent is called to do, is to love, care for, even here it says, uh, it can mean like providing for basic needs, like feeding them. 
which if you have teenagers, that's a pretty big task as it is, right? Just feeding them is a lot. So, so leadership is an act of love. So as parents, we're to love and nurture our kids. It's more than just basic providing for their needs. I think we in a modern day America do pretty good at that. We're, we've got it down. We're, we've got plenty of toys and plenty of clothes and plenty of food. Our kids are taken care of. We've got the organic food and we've got them eating healthy and we've got everything lined up there. But I think more of our problem comes down to the relationship of love and care we have for our kids. I ask the question, how are you loving and caring for your children? What kind of time do you spend with them? Just to, to think about it for a moment, there's a lot of examples here, and it can be so different. I, I know our families are different. Uh, everybody's different in this room about how you might spend. You know, you see these little guys will go on like a daddy-daughter date, and they'll go get some donuts, and that's what they'll spend time doing. But you can't take a one-size-fits-all. I can't say you should always spend, a, a, you know, a time every week with your kids for 30 minutes. It's different for everybody in this room. You have different kids. And I even feel it. I have three different kids, and each one, my relationship to them is just different. I, one night this week, I spent time with each one of them, and everything we did was completely different, right? One minute, I'm playing with toys. The next minute, I'm shooting a basketball. And the next minute, I'm just talking, right? That, that's how you invest in your children. So I guess I want to ask you the question, parents. How are you not just providing for the basic needs of your kids, but how are you loving, nurturing, and spending time with them, not just around them, and building that relationship. This is the building block of our faith. So uh, one of the ways I, I think we do this is by investing in them. But it has to be something that we already know how to do. Within the church, we talk about what we call discipleship. It's where we invest our lives in other people, right? If you've grown in the faith, you typically had somebody that was more mature than you helping you grow in your walk with the Lord. And we talk about this as somebody investing their life in you. And you as a Christian, once you become a follower of Christ, you should be making disciples. You should be investing your life in other people. And in many ways, parenting is just making disciples of little people in your home, right? These Children are people that you're making disciples of. And so your ability to parent well will be directly connected to your ability to teach the gospel and the things of the Lord to others. I have found that my experience as a pastor and as just a person who invests in other people, that experience of disciple making directly impacts my parenting because I know how to invest in somebody else. I know how to invest in my kids. So as you learn to invest in other people, that skill will then translate elsewhere. You may not realize uh, how it carries over. So let me give you an example. Um, maybe growing up in school, you, you felt like that the things you learned weren't going to matter in life, right? So you went to English class and you're sitting in class and you're learning about linking verbs and participles and you think, where in life am I ever going to use this? Anybody ever experienced that, right? Some kids in the room are probably like, man, I've been there, right? Maybe it's math. You go to math and there's, there's these prime numbers and integers and all this kind of stuff. Your head's spinning. You think, I'm never going to use this in life. Well, my son the other day, uh, he, he made a connection. I watched him connect Math class and real life. We, we, enjoy, we enjoy getting a Domino's pizza every now and then. And from Domino's, they make these things called Parmesan bread bites. Anybody had one of these Parmesan bread bites? They're, they're bites. They're small. They're little balls of dough. I feel like I'm giving a Domino's commercial this morning as you're thinking about it. And they're a little ball of dough. They've got butter and seasoning, I mean, they are, each bite, they're a bite, is 55 calories a piece. 
I looked that up and I wish I hadn't. <laughs> and so, so we order those as a family. And when they come to the house, they are a treasured commodity. You, so when they come in, we, we have five people in my family. And then you can order them in a box of 32. You, you're doing it already, aren't you? <laughs> so my son who's doing division at school starts going down. He said, well, we can each have six. He's putting the math together. He's like, there's two extra. Now I have to break it to him. The two didn't make it from the car ride home. <laughs> there's, a, there's a delivery fee, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he, he realized in that moment that what happened in math class translated to what would happen right there as you divided up real life. And, and I want to press you over to say that what happens in your personal walk and growth in the Lord and your ability to make disciples directly impacts your ability to parent and lead your home spiritually. Do, do you think that all of a sudden you're going to never lead anything spiritually, walk into your home and be able to read the Bible and pray and be active and be, be like John Payton's father, right? To be able to stand and hear you pray. So, so we as men, as as people have to grow in our walk with the Lord as, as moms and dads so that when our kids see us, they see someone walking with the Lord. And that ability to make disciples will transfer over to make us wonderful parents in the home. There's a third thing I want to show you today about godly homes. Godly homes have training and teaching. Within your home, there is a plan and an effort to train and teach your children. That means, mom and dad, you're not their best friend, you are their parent. You're there to teach them things from the word. And that's why I've talked about discipleship today, even what I'm about to talk about here. Even if you're not a parent in the room, you think I'm listening to this sermon, I, I don't have kids today. Th these, what I'm about to talk about is, is true for all of us. We're here to be examples like parents are to others. But look at the verse. There's two words I want to pull out about what fathers and mothers are called to do as well. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the, and here's the two words, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. First word, discipline. It means to train, instruct, reproof. Even includes at times as a disciplinarian, you're correcting things that are wrong in the home. But, but ultimately, you're, you're training your children. If you ever decide to get in shape, go to the gym, you walk in, you hire a personal trainer. Personal trainer comes over for a plan for your workout. It's got a plan for you there and a plan probably for what you're going to eat as well, right? There's a thoughtful plan put into place for you to train to be more healthy. Mom, dad, you should have a thoughtful plan to how you want to train your children. I'm convinced that half the reason we're not training our children is because we're not thinking or planning to do it at all. We fail to, to plan any sort of effort. You plan for vacations. You plan for projects around the house. Why would you not have a plan to try to see your children grow in the Lord? The other word is instruction or teaching. The, the, the word literally means to put into mind. We're, we're taking things, we're putting them in, them in the minds of our children. We're teaching them, we're counseling them, we're warning them of pitfalls of life. That's what we're doing here. We're, we're teaching and we're d disciplining or even discipling is a way to think about that word, right? That, that's how we as a parent teach our kids. Now back to, back to what I was talking about earlier. The, the teaching and the discipline is, you see it there in the text there at the very last phrase? What does it say? It is of the Lord. So what we teach our kids is of the Lord. So that, that means that 
even though we want our kids, and my kid's playing baseball right now, is that we want to teach them to have a correct swing, uh, or maybe at school you want to teach them to get their homework done or make straight A's. You want to teach all that. That's not what this verse is talking about. That, that's teaching that anybody can do. You don't even have to be a Christian to teach correct form on a baseball field or to teach how to get homework done or be, to be disciplined in those regards. That's not what we're teaching here. We're teaching them things of the Lord. So when we teach them to go onto a baseball field, we're actually teaching them how to be unselfish because Jesus was unselfish. How, how to encourage someone else because that's what we do as Christians. We're encouragers of others. The same things when we go to school. The reason we, we, we work hard and, and get good grades is because we want to bring glory to God. We want to give our best to him. You see, we're teaching how to be a follower of Christ. So, so let me ask you the question. This is the hard question here. How is your parenting different than someone who is not a Christian? How are you training your children? Because our homes should look different than the world. They, they should be teaching things of the Lord. Because mom, dad, you have the greatest influence in your child's life. Say it again. Mom and dad, you have the greatest influence in your child's life. You may not feel this way, especially if they're a teenager. They've got some friends you see kind of leading them down a certain path. But you have a great impact. I felt this way as a as I started my time in ministry, I was a student pastor for the first few years I was in ministry, and so I worked with teenagers, and so I had a front row seat for teenagers as they grew up in the home, and I watched something happen. Almost every student would grow rapidly to the point of maturity where their parents would be, but rarely and slowly would I see anybody be more mature than their parents were. And it was almost to a rule. I could see this person grows, but I could see they'll follow exactly what mom and dad will do. They would follow what happened at the home. Now, there are exceptions. It definitely happens. There's some of you in this room. You're a mature believer, and mom and dad were not the case. But it's because mom and dad, even though you may not realize it, you may not feel like it. Your kids are watching. I'll never forget years ago, just celebrated Easter a couple of weeks ago. We were uh, dyeing eggs and hiding them at the house. And that we did the real eggs, right? We'd hard boiled eggs and, you know, you dip them in the, the little colored water with the tablet. And so we would dye the eggs. And so kids dyed eggs and then we'd take them in the backyard and we'd hide them. And so we're out in the backyard, we're hiding these eggs, and I come across one, and it's cracked. It's pretty beat up. So I think, man, I don't, this is gross, right? I don't want to touch this egg anymore. So I'll like, take care of this, and I, I throw it over the fence. I just chuck it right out of the back of the yard. Figure, kid won't know. How do they know how many eggs we got here? And so we're wrapping up. We, she's picked up all the eggs, and fixing to pick them all up. And I think, I'm, all right, we're done. And I said, all right, you got all the eggs. She says, no, I'm, no, I'm not done. I said, what, what about, she's like, I got one more egg. I said, where's the egg? She's like, oh, it's behind the fence. <laughs> I, th I thought I was slick. I, I thought she wasn't watching, but she was actually watching the entire time. Mom, dad in the room, I know you may not feel like it today. You may not even feel like your kids are watching your life, but let me tell you something, they absolutely are. Even if you have grown children and they're out of the house today, they're watching you. They're watching how you act, how you love them. And so you and I need to live in our homes that example and teach and disciple them because I'm telling you, you have the greatest impact for the chance of the gospel. But I want to press one more thing, and I hope this is encouraging to you. This is the fourth thing I want you to see, is that godly homes have grace. Godly homes have grace. I just want to point you to that last phrase one more time. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, 
but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, there's a couple of temptations I think I see people run into with this verse. The first one is when we think, we think the spiritual responsibility is there, we pawn it off and we make it about everybody else. We think a couple hours at church, as long as I bring them Sunday morning, as long as I bring them another time during the week maybe, as long as they go to this one thing, VBS, whatever it might be, if I just do that, I can live how I want, they'll be okay. Maybe you've been dropping it on your spouse. You've been thinking that that's not really my job, they're the more spiritual one, they're the ones to lead the home. See, there's a danger of pushing this responsibility of discipleship on someone else. But I think there's another extreme, and this is one that, that many of us who are really trying, maybe you're here today and you're really trying to invest your life in your kids. The other extreme is to believe that it's all on you. That somehow you are going to be the deciding factor of whether your children come to faith in the Lord Jesus or not. But let me tell you something. You don't change hearts. You don't. You can't. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I, I, when I first had my eyes opened in my faith, I was really excited. I, wow, this, this Christian life is amazing. So then I thought, well, I, just, I can just tell people and I'll convince all of them, right? Have you ever tried to press somebody to being a Christian? Can't do it, can you? You can sit with them, you can spend hours, you can wear them down. I don't care how many things you say, but you can't change their heart. And mom and dad, this is the same thing is true for you today. You can't change the heart of your children. You can give them the gospel, you can give them the word, but, but we're dependent on God himself to save and grow our children. So I want to ask you today, how much are you praying for your kids? How much do you lift them to the Lord in prayer? Because at the end of the day, we're dependent upon the gospel to see their hearts changed. You pray them when they're two years old, six months old, five years old, 10 years old. I find that the older the kids get, the more you're pressed to prayer. But you should be dependent upon prayer the entire way through because ultimately, apart from the work of God and the gospel of Christ, the one who saves sinners, then we can't change a soul. Mom and dad, I've pressed on you, fathers, to be spiritual leaders in the home. But at the end of the day, we have to walk to the Lord, say, I am leading my home, but it is of you that heart change happens. I, I, I can't change my kid's heart. And ultimately, that's true for you as well. The last thing I'll say you can't disciple your children if you're not a follower of Christ yourself. You can't make a godly home if you're not following him yourself. And so today's maybe the day you turn from your sin, place your faith in Christ for the very first time, and from this moment, follow him in your home. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the work you've done in our hearts. And Lord, today I just want to close by praying for the families here. Lord, Lord, we ask for the dads in this room that you would strengthen them in their spiritual leadership of their homes. That they would walk faithfully with you. I pray for those in this room that have been far from you and have not led their homes well, that by the power of the gospel and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would restore them to their relationship with you first and second to their relationship to their family. Lord, I pray for those in this room as well who are striving to, to lead their homes well, that you would strengthen them to be faithful followers of you. 
And then finally, Lord, as parents, we pray for our kids. We lift up the names of those in this room that we don't believe are following you. We've tried to show them the way. We've spoken to them the gospel. And Lord, today we ask you to save them, to stir their hearts so they might turn towards you and trust you as their Savior. Lord, so that our homes might be pleasing and honoring to you. Pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, as we close our time, there is a moment of response. We'll sing in a moment. We'll take up our offering. That's a chance to worship. There'll be pastors and other leaders down here. There's a next steps area in the lobby. It's a place you can go and talk to somebody about how you can take a step. Maybe today you felt convicted. You, you don't know what to do. We're, we're here as a church to walk with you. But I would ask, even if you don't do any of that, just from your seat today, engage in prayer as we sing. We're gonna sing, Be Thou My Vision. Lord, help me to see how to lead. Help, Lord, Lord, make my heart yours. So as we pray, as we sing, let's ask the Lord to give us strength to lead our homes well. So let's stand and sing and respond to him today.
this chorus. understanding the immense challenge that you have before you, especially as parents. There's a weightiness to what you just heard today. Let it sit for just a moment. Let's just be still for a second and reflect on what we just heard from the Word of God. We just sang a song where, where we literally said, Thou my great Father and I thy true Son if you are in Christ you have a father who will joyfully and willingly give you wisdom and power and understanding to teach your children the incredible truths that we find in God's word and that next line thou in me dwelling and I with thee one the God who created the universe that same power who saved the Israelites time and time again is the same God, the same power that dwells in you if you are in Christ. You are not having to do this on your own because you have God the Father. You have a church family who loves you. You have pastors who will come alongside you to partner with you to help you fulfill the calling that God has placed upon you as parents to raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Use us. We love you and we want to be here for you. You have the power of the Spirit within you. That's powerful. It's incredible. We have resources available, but we also... And we want to come alongside you and your children. And we have an incredible opportunity this summer for the first time in a long time, at least 16 years, this church is doing a vacation Bible school. And we are excited to partner with you to teach your children the incredible truths that we find in God's Word, the truths that the world is going to tell them is a lie. We have about 250 already signed up. And that's not just children in preschool and elementary. We have children from our special needs ministry. We also have adults from our special needs ministry that are going to be coming to this building. About 15% of those are not connected to a church, which means they're either lost or they need a new church home. And you, church family, have an opportunity. You, mom and dad, have a chance to share with your children what is important to come alongside together as a family to serve alongside one another for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you guys walk out of this room, if you head out that way and hang to the left, there is a setup for Vacation Bible School where you can register your children, but you yourself can register to serve where you as a church body can serve together for the furtherance of the gospel. I want to ask that you kind of just make that left and get some information. Let's pray as we exit today. God, we thank you for being who you are. We thank you that you are the one true Father, the God who dwells in heaven, who sits on the throne, who does no wrong, who will always do his will. And God, we thank you that for those of us who are in Christ, that the power you use to do everything is the power that dwells within us. And so we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us as we parent our children. And Father, I pray for our kids. 
God, I pray that your spirit would convict them of their sin, move them to godly repentance to where they would trust in you. And I pray that you would equip these parents to disciple their children, to teach them the gospel, to teach them to enjoy you and to glorify you in everything. And we pray for this VBS that is coming up, that God, that it would be just an incredible vehicle that would point people back to the gospel and it would be a vehicle that would unite our church together through an act of service. As we go out today, as we go out this week, empower us to teach our children your word. Amen.